So we're going to be speaking about uh, purpose and spirituality. And I am blessed to be with such a, a wonderful group of people. I'm sure this is going to be a rich discussion. Thank you for joining us. So uh, I'd like to begin by just inviting each of you uh, to share a little bit about your path first and how you have uh, come to where you are on your path and, and what that looks like. And I will actually, I'll follow Andrea's lead from yesterday. So if uh, at any point it, we need to move on a little bit in time, you might find me expressing satisfaction with something like a, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you know that we need to just shift on a little bit. Okay? Okay. So, Ahmed, would you be willing to share a little bit about your path and how you have arrived here today and what goes on in your life now? Uh, I think my real path that I am aware of started approximately 11 years ago when I stumbled on the uh, practice of meditation. And so since then I've been studying and teaching meditation as a deliberate practice. That's where I am at now. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my path really started in my early 20s as a result of trying to find resolution from a lot of personal pain. And it uh, has been a, a sort of varied path, a, definitely a winding path in that uh, it started in Ann Wilson Shafe Process Therapy and moved into courses of psychic development, which led to integrative breath work and a three-year divinity program. And then going into uh, studying into the tantric arts to have more sense of embodiment and integration. And that led me to meditation and traveling and discovering in Asia and India, and uh, ultimately it led me to the medicine. Um, and for the last 14 years, the medicine work has really been the thrust of my own personal development and discovery and purpose. Thank you, Lila. So, because the universe has amazing ways to humble us, um, I, I, I use this phrase that I used to think I was special and I just realized I was desperate. <laughs> and it's been a journey of, of realizing actually that um, coming to terms with how hard life actually is. And like Leela, experiencing deep trauma in my childhood that you know, only over the past few years or past decade have I really come to terms with how hard it is to be human. But in that pain and in that suffering, uh, I wanted something more. I wanted something deeper. And spent my life at a really young age, in my early teens, uh, after my mother tried to commit suicide, I began studying death. And so my gateway into the spiritual path was learning everything I possibly could about what the great wisdom traditions say about death and dying. And in my teens, because of my deep study into dying and the death process, I began to have these spontaneous out-of-body experiences. These are these, this, so where the subtle body somehow finds its way to be separate from the physical body. And I began exploring all these dream realms. And I was pretty convinced that something had to be beyond death because of this capacity for the subtle body to be separate. That led me on a journey of uh, actually hearing this term awakening or enlightenment. And as soon as I heard that there was something possible, there was some deep meaning of life, like what Ken was pointing to, there was some absolute purpose, I knew that that was what I wanted to dedicate my life to, that nothing else other than that would be satisfying. And so I went on that journey, I'm on that journey. I find myself studying in the Tibetan Buddhist lineages of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and I have the great privilege of studying with Ken for about 15 years, also, studying with uh, Daniel P. Brown, who was my mentor and thesis advisor at Harvard. So I look forward to sharing with you more. Thank you, Dustin. 
Hello everyone, I'm Gigi. And my path started when I was around 15 years old and really took flight at 16 years old. So obviously I was an extremely observant little girl and something felt truly off with the world. So I grew up in a Muslim family and they put me through Catholic school in New Jersey because that was the best schooling that I could get. And in New Jersey, there's so many different economic classes, religions, different types of people and relationships. And there was one theme, as the Buddha would say, that was true for all of those people, no matter how rich they are or how married or how single they were or how big their house was, was that they were not happy. And I saw that at a young age. And so there was this deep question like, okay, so then what is it then? What is it? If it's not money, if it's not a relationship, if it's not the best degree in the world, then what is it? And it was obvious to me from the traditions that I was in was that these saints, these prophets, these messengers, even though they were going through the worst of times, there was something inside of them that was extremely peaceful and content. And so I wanted to know how to build that bridge to spirit, even though they told me I couldn't. That was only for the prophets and the messengers. So that's what began my search. And so I went to shamanism because shamanism said that you can't speak to spirit. And then from there, there was still a discontent because I wanted to know what the truth was. And shamanism wasn't still telling me what that, what that truth was. And so then I went to non-duality. And one of my last teachers has been Adi Ashanti. And so now I come into the world um, in this purpose is to bridge the old paradigm. And the old paradigm is very shadow masculine. It's you are not your body. You are not your emotions, you are not your thoughts. It's very much negates our humanity. And we're building this new bridge. And I've been leading this group, Urban Awakening, for three years that's building this bridge that says, yes, ultimately we are not our bodies, but here we are in this sacred body. And how are we supposed to use this vehicle? My emotions are extremely important. My intuition is extremely important as a navigation tool to the divine. My thoughts are extremely important as creativity to fuel my purpose. And so my purpose is bridging this gap now between these two areas. Wonderful, thank you all. So um, just because it's my job here to illuminate and highlight the gold that's on the stage, there's a little bit more of the gold here that I would like to illuminate if it's okay. So, um, Ahmed, actually, uh, if I can describe something of your biography as I know it, Ahmed grew up uh, around Sufi teachers and actually was radicalized at the age of, uh, in Egypt, and was radicalized at the age of 16, uh, was in prison for three years, um, and between, I think, it was 16 and 19, is that right? 16 to 20, and really, you are 17 to 20, and his path, uh, as far as a kind of really engaging a spiritual path, kicked off at, at 20 and has been going on ever since. And you've studied at MIT and neuroscience and linguistics. And part, and I want to get into some of the um, social justice dimensions around purpose with all of you in a minute. There's a number of things. But I know part of your purpose is to, um, to help update the understanding of spirituality in the Arab world. Um, by framing it in terms of uh, in terms of science, so there's a few themes here which I'd like to to get into. Uh, the first of all, I'd like to just ask you. Um, sometimes people have the perspective that purpose itself itself is more of a masculine conversation, and I'd like to check in with you on that. Like, does the word purpose even resonate for you? Do, can we do we feel that there are masculine and feminine approaches to purpose? If not purpose, you're all people who have had uh, a, a strong and deep continued alignment and sense of path. What is it that you feel has been the driving force or the, how would you describe that, that path has unfolded for you, if, if not purpose? Well, There isn't just one purpose. There are multiple purposes that we go through in life. Uh, and there is also a standard deviation around purposes that you drift from one purpose and you come back to it and then you fall into 
a different purpose and uh, you carry on for a while and then you maybe you'll get bored of it if there's no excitement and then you jump into a new purpose, etc. But I think <clears throat> the segment of this, uh, of us here is future of spirituality, I'm assuming, and, and purpose. It seems as we need to redefine spirituality because it's such a fluffy term. And uh, what I myself, according to my experience, have been engaged in is to look at it from a scientific point of view, from a science uh, point of view. So the practices that I personally have been developing with others, obviously, is through EEG technologies, whereby you focus on just one thing, which is you learn, i.e. the brain, the brain, how to make it learn, improve, and refine. Screw up and learn, improve, refine, screw up. And thus, you will optimize that brain, that only tool that you have with which you pick purpose or purposes. So without that optimization, we're not going anywhere. You'll make lots of regrets and lots of errors. You'll regret them later. So the focus that I have is always develop a practice. I say that for myself, everybody else. Just like any athlete, anyone who has a profession, what do they do in it? They learn the brain, i.e. the brain learns, improves, and refines. And repeat, learn, repeat. So this is what I would like to really just focus on all the time. If you want to optimize your brain, if you want to reduce the frequency of errors in your life, your decision making, you've got to develop a practice. So, and that is a purpose that I'd like to just share with you that has worked for me. And uh, it would be nice just for us all to uh, have something similar. Thank you, Ahmed. Can I ask Gigi or Lila? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was talking to John before, <laughs> and we were talking about, um, so for me, I can't do much unless I connect to a feeling of mission and purpose. But it is true that as a woman, and as a woman that is very much in the spiritual path, dedicated to spirituality, and very much also coming into her body fully now, in that stage of coming into, into the body fully, that, the, that I feel everything, I feel the words in my body. And so when the word, when we say, okay, we're going to have a conversation about purpose, I can't deny that there is a contraction in my body. And that contraction is like, oh, a bunch of men talking about purpose. How far has that brought us? All right. <laughs> so even though I am a woman and I have a very balanced masculine presence, the word purpose, and, and I need to connect to my purpose, it still brings up something inside of me that says, oh, here we go again, right? More, better, different purpose. And what I feel is so lacking, again, is that conversation of, but what about the body? What about what we need right now? What about the pain that we're all in right now? And that pain that we're bringing into our purpose and filtering through into our purpose and therefore our purpose is never truly able to be clean and is still full of separation because of our own pain. When are we gonna talk about the pain that we all carry and how that pain is very much linked to us not being able to fulfill our true purpose? Beautiful, thank you. That, that's actually a topic I would love to, to come back to. I would say I, I also feel that purpose isn't a word that I have a lot of resonance with. It's not a, a driver for me in my life. I think my purpose has actually been something that's really been a natural emergence as I feel into what I feel most aligned with. And so I think alignment is something that I, I have more of a relationship to and what is more of the driver for me. And uh, spirituality also isn't a word that I, I feel uh, 
a lot of kinship with it. I think, again, it's a word that's really overused and become quite generic. For me, a spiritual path is, has really, again, been an unfolding of a, an ever-renewing commitment to creation itself and that which has created the universe, that's which created me and continues to create everything that is in our manifest reality and beyond. So uh, I don't know if it's a matter of masculine or feminine. Obviously, I, being embodied in a, in a woman's body, I, you know, I have that immediate experience. But, but I, I am glad to, to have the question asked because you know, to hear the word purpose said over and over and over again and then to not have a relationship with it per se, it's like, where does that leave me? <laughs> like, what do I do with that fact that I don't have that connect there? So maybe, maybe, we're not, maybe I'm not alone in that. I don't think you're alone in that. <laughs> I'll, I'll just make a, a brief comment on this and that, you know, as you brought up the idea of masculine and feminine and I think both of you have mentioned it. And of course, this isn't news to people in the room, but if we each have an inner masculine, inner feminine. And the degree to which we have gone through our own initiatory process to awaken our own masculine and feminine um, is the degree to which, I think as Gigi's saying, we've actually come in contact to this integration between more of an absolute awakening beyond exclusive identification with any of these layers of reality and a deep integration with them, including the body, including emotions, and including all of the pain that we've actually been through. It's only by going through that integration that we come in contact with others' pain and the pain of the world. And I would say that for me, there's a dimension of purpose that resonates, and that's that we have both vertical purpose, that's where we're aligning to something, as Leela's saying, but we also have horizontal purpose, the way in which we build horizontally through community and through relationship, through the body, through touch, through interacting with each other. And those are, of course, both on the relative side, but then on this more absolute side, as Ken was pointing to, there is an absolute purpose, and that, I would say, is singular for all of us, that Whatever the path you might be on, it's possible to come to know all of reality as an integrated whole. And uh, I think you said that very well, Gigi, and I think we share that on the panel. Did, did you say there is an absolute purpose? Yeah, I would say that, and this can be a dialogue too, which I think is awesome, so we're not just like, we're looking at each other. And yeah, I'd really invite you guys, if anyone says anything yeah. that you think, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Yes, I would say. If, if, so you, if you feel that, uh, no, I want to pick up on that, please. I would love this to be a dialogue. Yeah. Well, Let's, Dustin and I was sparred for years. We do. So and okay. Ahmed and I are dear friends. So this, is, this gives us a chance to maybe even uh, you know, do this together as a, as a group. Um, absolutely. I think that there's an absolute purpose. I would just yeah. say prove it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I would say that even, and I know, because you're my dear brother, that in your own experience that you learned through practice that there is an aspect of your own sense of awareness that's not caught in the sense of conventionality or conventional self. But you've come in contact with something that's pure and beyond that. So whether we call that absolute purpose or not, there's something that is accessible to all human beings that gives them a sense of freedom and liberation. You don't need to prove anything. Just, it's, just a, it's a pathway that's possible. Yes, I agree with you. but. The Sure, we'll just disagree that it's not really absolute. It's Fine. just a purpose. Fine, oh, a purpose. Multiple. Okay. With a capital P, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you guys. So, um, so I appreciate uh, us being in the exploration of whether the, the word purpose is the right word, the, the, the feelings it evokes in our bodies. I was saying to someone yesterday, my, my partner came back from a, uh, a retreat with Bill Plotkin, and, and uh, I love this woman with all my heart, and she has repeatedly said to me, you know, purpose doesn't really do it for me, John. And she said, on this retreat, we, talk, we spoke about longing. Uh, we really just fell into our longing. But it was very clear that we were speaking about the same thing. And so I, I would like to just ask you, you know, where has your purpose, your longing, your alignment been pointing you? Or where has it been unfolding? Where, where has it been moving you? in a way where you have felt alive and passionate and interested and maybe confused at the same time, but yeah, alive and passionate with where it's going. Yes, this I actually can answer. It's just, I think I will, I relate to your experience a lot as have grown up in a Muslim culture 
and uh, seeing that we are better than everybody else, etc. And that totally just colored our realities growing up. And then we come in this culture and we meet these amazing people and we just really see the, uh, what love means in reality, not just as words. It's being practiced here. They welcome us and we suddenly we're just in contact, in contact with these amazing people. And just so much love. So what I'd like to do uh, is to take this experience and to just show the world what America is. This is kind of different dialogue, but America, in my point of view, is an idea, is a beautiful idea. And every planet needs an America. And whether there is an America here, but America lives no matter what, it's a fantasy in our minds. And so, if you bet, I will bet on the idea of America always, whether it's embodied in a continent, in a state. And so when I look at all the countries and the continents in the world, and then I find this a state of California, I was so amazed. And then if you secrete all of that, you get San Francisco, you get the Bay, and you get Palo Alto, the Silicon Valley, the, the places that I've been exposed to, and I just see the cream, of, I see the best of the best intentions here. And that's why I moved here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd just like to drive this a little bit further, is a, uh, so I, I really have just been teaching a uh, meditation deliberate practices in order to reduce violence in our reconciling of our inner problems in our brains. Our brain is also a continent, by the way. By the way. So I'm just here coming from a neuroscientific point of view. The class that we taught part of at Stanford and will be teaching is really we just give students about 20 different devices and uh, we have a 16 channel EEG and we put the EEG on the brain and we can see how you can change your mental state from frenzy, beta, like we're having right now, to a better mental state, to the ultimate, i.e. the creativity mental state on demand and you can do it within just minutes. This is what I mean by optimizing the brain, you'll be able to create, you'll be able to shift your mental consciousness, your mental state to the most ultimate, the most performing mental state. And that is what I'd like to take from here, and hopefully soon we'll be doing this in the, uh, Egypt, and we'll be, in, we'll be doing it in uh, other countries as well, with the work with Anil and Dustin and others who will be helping us. Thank you. That's a purpose. Yeah. I can feel your passion. Thank you, Ahmed. For me, um, I, again, my path started at 16, so I'm 36 now, and say I say that at 15 years of my spiritual path, I spent completely spinning. And it was spinning because of the ideas that were fed to me over and over and over again. And the, so those ideas were meditation is the only way to enlightenment. I did not have a meditation practice, so I was kind of screwed, right? Um, what I did have, though, was an ex like such an extreme devotion, a moment-to-moment -moment devotion. So whether I was in college or doing my master's degree or I was doing a career or I was in a relationship, what was still always in my heart was God. So I had that, but I didn't have a sit-down practice. And later on, I find out, actually, the moment-to-moment -moment practice is way more important than that sit-down practice. I was taught that my body is an illusion. And so for years, I spent time not taking care of myself or running away from the body or running away from any emotion that didn't seem spiritual enough, right? So these were the things that I just kept getting pounded into my head. And when I finally had like, whatever that awakening was or whatever that moment was and whatever those teachings were that actually Yes, ultimately I'm not my body, but here I am, and here is the sacred vehicle. Yes, some emotions are total garbage and just recycled stuff from my own pain, 
but a lot of the times my emotions and my intuition is exactly how the divine is talking to me about where to go next, right? So my longing now is pointing me towards how do we keep bringing this conversation to the millennials? How do we, how do we have groups, which I was saying I lead Urban Awakening for the past three years here, leading groups that are in circles and not in hierarchy, leading groups where we're having these conversations about how to be in contact with the body. Like Ken was saying, a lot of teaching is waking up, but very little is about how to actually have an awakened life here. So my longing is to bring these teachings more and more so that it's more of a conversation about what we're growing into and building that bridge again from the old paradigm of spiritual teaching to where we're entering, which is, yes, I am my body. Yes, I honor my emotions. Yes, my moment-to-moment -moment practice is important. Yes, the feminine way of, of being in life is going to be no longer negated. Thank you. Um, I think my longing is largely to provide an arena for not only the states of waking up and growing up, but for a place where there can be cleaning up. And I feel that the medicinal world is so beneficial in that aspect. Um, and the other thing that's so important about that medicinal realm is that not only does it allow us an arena in order to clean up, to address and meet those aspects that have been relegated to the shadow and disembodied, it also gives us a community to literally remember what it is that's essential and to correct that relationship, not only within ourselves, within the family, but also to the natural world and to that which exists beyond the natural world, which, you know, again, I think uh, the way that we live largely in, on this earth right now is so isolated, separated, and busy uh, that we have really lost touch with what's most elemental. And so I'm, I'm super grateful that for myself that the, the medicines have reestablished that connection and continue to reinforce it. And I've, I'm grateful to essentially be able to present a space for people to also come back to that sense of connectivity to, to everything, really, especially to source. And for those of you who are interested, Leela has an amazing chapter in this book. Uh, purpose Rising about cleaning up in the indigenous traditions, so check it out. It's a, it's a beautiful chapter. You know, f for me, the longing started off as, as an individual longing and an individual seeking, and an individual path. And very quickly, as, as the, the, and I, I do want to say just to Gigi's point, that very quickly, as some of these ancient traditions, as I was exposed to them, I was also exposed to, to more esoteric versions of those ancient traditions that did include the body, that did include sexuality, that did include emotions, and the tantric turnings of both Buddhism and Hinduism do this well. That as I was exposed to those traditions, slowly my purpose and my longing moved from just me as an individual and became more of what we can do, what all of us can do as a human species and what's possible for all of us. And I'll share just a short metaphor that really encapsulates that, that I received from a dear teacher that John and I both share named Bruce Lyon. He said, and this really, for me, it's the heart of the longing that I feel and actually what keeps me moving day by day. He said, we're moving from a solar age to a galactic age. Just fancy language to say that in a solar age, there's a sun and there's planets that revolve around that sun. There's the single illumined being and there's the disciples that revolve around that being. In certain ways, you know, planets need their light from the sun until they have their own light. So there's a certain appropriateness to that. And we can transcend that particular model, including it where appropriate, but transcending it. When we transcend it, we move into a galactic model, a galactic formation, where we begin to look around at each other and we recognize, wow, we're all suns. We are all these suns that are organically in the gravitational field of this incredible black hole. And that black hole is really the true purpose, that eros that Ken was speaking about, that infinite possibility that circles between us, where there's no one person in the center, yet here we are in formation as constellations of suns together. And so my deepest longing, what's really alive for me, is what happens when we start to stand as suns together uh, across cultures, across traditions, and we begin to offer the potential of what it's like to be human, what it's like to be awakened, what it's like to be on purpose, 
I think there's something about that particular model that's going to be hard to push to the side. I often say that the single spiritual teacher is easily pushed to the fringes of society, but when we stand together in a harmonious vision, even if we use different language or different pathways, there's something that can emerge collectively where it's not going to be able to be ignored on the global stage. So I long for that. I long for that for, for all of us. I long for that for humanity so that we can actually start to navigate and find our purpose using the constellation of stars so we can start wayfinding our way to realization. Wonderful. Thank you. So something I'd like to explore with you guys, um, and I think it could be helpful for, for people here, is so something I perceive in each of your paths, and I think each of you have mentioned, is that in the earlier stages of your life, there was a lot of pain. And you went through some really hard stuff. And there was a sense of deep isolation and disconnection and confusion and uh, perhaps injustice as well. Um, and in certain ways, I don't know if you'd phrase it this way, please correct me if you'd phrase it differently, but that actually acted as fuel. There was a, a fueling there that happened that has been part of what's propelled you on the journeys that you've taken. The, the journeys you have taken and the place you find yourself now, the activities, the pathways, the explorations that you've been in, were all very much fueled in a certain way by the sense, the, the pain and the disconnection that was previously there. In my exposure to purpose work, you know, there's a lot of work around what they describe as the core wound and the relationship between our core wound and how that, how that relates to the the gifts that we end up wanting to give to the world or explore our lines of exploration. So, because I also have the sense that basically everyone on the spiritual path has this in their own, ver in their own version, um, and the relationship to our pain, the relationship to our sense of disconnection or isolation is often one of the most difficult and challenging aspects of being on a path, which a lot of people, as I think to your point, try and push away. And, you know, it's made bad or it's, you know, seen to be an obstacle for a long time. I'd like to just fill into this with you, each of you, how you see this, how you see the relationship between the pain, the wound, the, the sense of disconnection that you experienced in earlier parts of your life, and the pathway that you've taken from there. Is that okay? Okay, since we're going this way. <laughs> pain is always there. It's what will change with practice is the reaction to the pain. If we check the pain, the pain in, under the, the, what happens in the brain and the fMRI with AEG, pain is there. But your reaction, the reactivity to it is just different. You don't feel it like a non-practitioner feels it. But pain is always there. Why is pain important then at the beginning of the path? Because without pain, we're not going to wake up. We'll continue in the repetitive, boring, dull dream. Nothing will eject us out of this realm of pain, unless a camel, I'll say a camel because we're from Egypt here, <laughs> but you can say an elephant from, yeah, come. <laughs> it, it jumps and sits in your chest in a dream, you're not gonna wake up. Unless it turns into a nightmare, your threshold of pain will be, it's like the, the metaphor of the, uh, the frog that sits in a pond and the ponds he keeps on increasing in temperature, and he dies. Why he did not feel the variant, the change in temperature. And so, unless it just jumps the temperature higher, the frog is not gonna notice that, oh my God, I've been in pain all my life. I'm 70 years old now, 80 years old now, I'm 90 years old, old now on the deathbed, and I have not noticed that I lived a miserable life. Because misery would just drip, 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 drip without feeling the difference. Pain is important. Now, <clears throat> what happens then when you uh, dip into the realm of practicing, you develop sensors, new sensors, because you, your attention becomes so sharp, and you sense all of the changes on the peripheral nerves. You, ch you feel the change. Any iota of change, you will feel it. It will quickly send the sensor feedback to the brain, a disaster. And that disaster could just be a, something very gentle happened, changed, a, an itch in your throat before you get an influenza or 
a call two weeks before, and then you'll sense it before it comes, so you prevent it better, or at least you're prepared for it. There are no surprises. The more you train your brain, I mean, making sense so far. Yeah, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed. But what I take from that is, is um, that pain is an important part of the path. I think this is exploration. What I take from, wait, to put more on that is pain, when, when you're on the path and you're really dedicated, pain starts becoming an alarm system for you. So here's discomfort, here's pain, here's contraction. Oh, I'm asleep at the wheel. Oh, I'm believing something again. I'm going back into that pattern again. Or, oh, I've actually completely betrayed and abandoned myself and completely let my boundaries loose and I need to take care of myself again. So pain is always an alarm system for me now, but it takes time, like you said, to sense, to sense that little, uh, oh, okay. And so that takes us years of learning how to slow down enough to actually feel it before it snowballs into something huge and then you've got some type of drama on your hands. So for, for me, and again, to go into, into like global pain was a big problem for me on my path. And then it, it, I understood it from more of a feminine point of view, is especially the feminine just feels this global pain in this intense way in her body, in her whole system, and it's just like such extreme grief so it wasn't just my pain that I was learning how to be with. It was also this, like, watching the news and watching a woman come on and say something about losing her son at war and just all, all of me becoming distraught, sad, depressed. And having a moment with my best friend where he looked at me and he said, Gigi, would you be where you are right now with all, without all of the pain and without all of the suffering that you went through? And it's not, it's not that I haven't heard that idea before, but it was like one of those moments of grace where his arrow met my arrow. And for some reason, just completely through grace, that, that incessant suffering that I had for other people's pain just stopped. And that's grace. I just, I don't know why it just stopped. Again, it wasn't the first time I heard it. But... What I'd like to say to wrap up on my part is there is an illusion. Hi, John. <laughs> there is an illusion that we have. Again, this is the old paradigm. The illusion is you're going to wake up, you're going to have an awakening, or you're going to become enlightened, and you will not feel pain anymore. You will not suffer anymore. You will not have hard things come up anymore. And that's a lie. That is a complete lie. When you wake up, when you have an extreme awakening, even if you go into enlightenment, there will be pain, there will be suffering, and there is this adage that goes, well, there's suffering, but there is no pain. But you, let's just get real, there's pain, and it's okay. And that's why we, it's okay. It's okay for there to be pain. It's okay for there to still be negativity inside of you. But again, it's always just an alarm system, a devotional way for you to say, hey, can I stop, can I slow down? Can I check in what this is, what this means to me, and what this means in my overall pattern and what I can change? But, sorry, John. Are we talking about pain, physical pain or psychological pain? So, well, it could be either. It could be either. But, but, but Gigi, before we but, go further, I'd like to go a little bit further with you here. So you spoke about the, um, the urban awakening work that you have been doing and how a big focus of that has been to address exactly some of the points that you, you were just making. Would you say that um, that that your sense of purpose in that, your sense of clarity, your sense of like, yes, I feel, I, I know this is what I need to bring, has been fueled in a certain way by the the feeling of like, no, <laughs> you know, to all this stuff that you were coming into contact with, these ideas in the domain of spirituality or the way conventional spirituality is spoken, that you had such a kind of like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, reaction to it. It's like, I just want to check in with you there on like the fuel dimension. Are you, are you saying that I had a no to the old way of spirituality? I'm, I, I'm wondering whether you see the challenge that you went through as fuel. It is fuel because like, okay. I, like when, I'm, when I'm teaching, I say, 
I spent 15 years of my spiritual path saying, this is not a spiritual feeling. This is not a spiritual thought. This is not a spiritual whatever. And literally just pushed it over for 15 years mm -hmm. because I was taught 100% of your thoughts are not true. Mm -hmm. All of your stories are just stories. Your patterns are just patterns. Who you are is the absolute. Who you are is this vastness that's beyond all of this. And so it kept teaching me to shove it away. And so, yeah, my fuel now is to say, all of that is true and this is how you deal with it so that you could bring your purpose, you could bring your awakening into life. You cannot bring your awakening without your body. You cannot bring your awakening without being in touch with your emotions. Mm -hmm. You cannot bring your awakening into daily life without learning how to work with your mind. Mm -hmm. And you can, so you can't negate any of those things. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's fuel. Thank <laughs> you. I would say for myself that absolutely my pain was my greatest catalyst. And I remember um, going to see a friend of mine do a one-man show. And she uh, was a woman who was adopted. And her show was all about her process of being surrendered by her birth mother. And um, w the gift, ultimately, that that gave her. And it, for me, it was really like a a super strong moment because although I wasn't adopted, my mother did surrender me and I, in, uh, you know, like that, the pain of that, of not being wanted by your own mother is, yeah, fierce. And it is also absolutely what catapulted me on the quest for the mother, like that great mother that <clears throat> could never, ever abandon me. And I remember being in Brazil one morning and uh, realizing like, this, this mother, this mother earth that we all live on the back of, like it is impossible for it to abandon me. Like that is not even a possibility. Mm -hmm. And the, the relief that came from that, but I would have never been on that search to begin with if that original pain hadn't happened. And I think one of the other things that I really, really love about the ceremonial work is that uh, maybe a twist on what you just said is that, that pain is there, but suffering is actually optional. And I, I, again, one morning, you know, in, a, in the night of a ceremony, for those of you who have done medicinal, medicinal work, you can know that sometimes it's like really a lot of physical suffering. And, and I had been working with the medicine for a long time and was sort of in this repeated pattern of being in a lot of physical suffering. And I remember one night thinking like, okay, this might be it. This might be what it is like for the rest of my drinking career. So how do I reorient my relationship to suffering? And, and that also was just like a hugely valuable question. So I'm, but you have to be at the brink of that, like, God, literally, please help me. And, and those moments where I have been like on my knees and praying, praying for that change, those have been the absolutely the pivot points in my life. So I'm, I'm always really grateful for the, the, that pain. And, and again, for those of you that have been in medicinal ceremonies, it's like usually the, the hardest ceremonies, like they're the best. Man, you get so much work in one night. Maybe you save yourself lifetimes, you know? So it's like, thank you. Thank you. It's often, it's often said that the, there are only two openings in which one becomes available for the spiritual path. Either you have everything or you have nothing. So either you're desperate or you've tried everything else. But it's in that middle range where things are actually quite dangerous because there's this drip that, that Ahmed was talking about. There's this sense of everything's sort of okay and you don't really re realize the amount of misery that one has. And you know, one of the things that we know from neuroscience, just to build on some of Ahmed's points, and I, I'm not a neuroscientist, so let me speak at a layman's level, but I have good teachers. So that one of the things that we know happens is that in neuroscientifically, when we begin, begin to focus our mind, we activate our ACC, our interior cingulate cortex. What that allows us to do is to focus our attention. What also happens is we begin to deactivate the PCC, which is a sense of regulation of self and space and time. So that's when we're practicing. Those people who don't have any sort of practice, and I would definitely include ceremonial work, I would definitely include prayer, this constant reflection on the divine. It doesn't matter what the practice is, it means that there's some conscious awareness that's happening. But the most people rest in what's called a default mode network 50% of the time or more. What happens in that particular mode is that our mind isn't focused, it's actually wandering, and that there's a constant referencing of the self. 
So think about these two different scenarios. In one scenario, your mind's wandering and you're thinking about yourself. In the other one, the, the mind is actually focused on whatever you put your attention on and that the self-referential aspect is deactivated a bit. It's a much more pleasant state of being, but most people are so unaware that they're actually caught in the state of constant self-reference, in the state of constant dis sort of associated or wandering mind. They don't even realize they're suffering. And I'll just say one point personally, is that you know, a lot of times when I used to share with people, I'd share in this abstract way, in a third person way, but I've realized more and more that bringing my own personal story in actually helps sometimes. So I just wanna share one piece about my personal journey, and that's that my deepest wound was feeling like I didn't matter. So in my family structure and larger scenarios, there was a sense of not feeling inherent value or mattering. What I realized as I began sharing spirituality with other people was that one of the best things that I could offer them was a sense of presence, a sense of love, and a sense of letting them know that they mattered. They mattered at least to me. And the more and more that I've been on that path and I've shared that with people, I've realized, wow, as a human species right now, and as a planet, we haven't actually claimed our own dignity like how much we actually matter. There's a, there's a sense that we haven't recognized the fact that we have to take care of ourselves, that we have to really nurture ourselves in a deep place of mattering. And I suspect, as I just sort of peer into the future, that when we actually recognize our own value, we'll recognize that we, as a human species and as a planet, actually have something of deep value to contribute to the cosmos that there's a planetary purpose that's moving through us and as us, and that there's something we can contribute to cosmic family, cosmic community, as we continue to evolve. So I wanna just point us to the possibility of claiming our own dignity, not only as individuals, but as a planet. There's something valuable innately that we have, and that we can value, and we start by valuing our own inner feminine, and by valuing the planet, and everything that's happening, so. Thank you. So I hope, uh, I hope everyone has a sense as well. I'm not just trying to take us on a downer, right? <laughs> as far as the, the conversation about pain and wounding is concerned. Uh, my interest to discuss this with these people is that um, for people interested in purpose work, for people who are attempting to explore their own purpose, often there's a very strong duality. And there's a sense of, well, I don't know my purpose and I'm in a bunch of pain, or I've got a sense of the, my right direction, but I've got a, all this stuff which is blocking me and I've got to get rid of that and get on that. And in my experience and in a lot of the people I've witnessed, it can be a very liberating thing to recognize actually the relationship is a bit more nuanced. That often it's the, the, the stuff that we go through that is an incredible fuel for for the path that we end up taking. So um, we have about seven minutes left. And um, yeah, I was going to ask if anyone has questions for the audience. Brandon Peel, I saw your larger than life hand. <laughs> yeah, um, so really for anybody, I, but I'm, I was really provoked by this question of like, is this purpose thing a masculine endeavor? And I don't hold it that way at all. Like I feel it's embodied and incorporated. And I'm just curious, is there, is there a way that we can make this languaged or presented so that it's like, yeah, we're all part of this. This is like what it means to be fully human and it's agentic and receptive and all the, all the good things of both. Okay, you answered the question. It's great. <laughs> but it is the answer. We don't need to elaborate on it. I, I feel the same way and I'm sure we do. Well, let's check in. But, but there might be other questions that are worthy of really just spending these six minutes on. But I'm saying that I agree with you. I think we we'll all agree that it is all of us feel the same way. We're, it's not, we talked about it, but go ahead. We'll take just a moment. Sure. Seven minutes. Um, again, for me, Brandon, Thanks, it, would Brandon. Be, it would be, is the conversation about psychological pain absolutely included? Like, is it 50% of the conversation or is it 10% of the conversation? Because we are driven from our filters and our blocks. And so if we talk about purpose and we don't talk about how are we going to help everyone become more embodied in their awakening, in dealing with their pain, in being comfortable with their discomfort, then our purpose is not gonna go that far anyway. I think, 
again, not being somebody, you know, I really always envied those people that knew what their purpose was. I, I, I was like, what must that be like to know, just to know, like some people just know. I was always like the ma jack of all trades, master of none, and, and I still am. So it's like, what do those people like me, that we have skill sets in all sorts of areas, like how are we supposed to have one purpose? Like, I, I can't do that, I'm not that. So I think ultimately, for me, the dialogue is more about what brings fulfillment and what brings right relationship to all of creation so that there's a benefit for everything, for all sentient beings, for this planet. And, and I think, I'm, I'm sure that's happening, but it's not necessarily in the forefront of the languaging. So in, in, in that absence, I, I feel a little like I get lost in the cracks. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Do, you. do you want to add anything, Dustin? Okay. Thank you, Brian. We have over here, Samantha. Oh, this is juicy. I, I have to grab the mic because so many women in the space are looking at me right now. Like, I'm, I've been catching all these glances, so like, are you going to say something? What are you going to say? And I just want to out that women have been coming up to me since yesterday. I've had a lot of men thank me for what I brought. I've had a lot of women ask me this same question, and I just wanted to, like, emphasize, to take the mic and emphasize how freaking critical this is, and to name that the men in the group go, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> the men in the group go to certainty, and the women go into nuance. Have you guys, uh, that's what I'm noticing. And it goes very deep. It's men talking about optimal brain states, about spaces that are fairly controllable. It's women talking about chaos and what can't be controlled. There's a really strong gender divide in, in between who's bringing what to the conversation. And I wanted to like flush that out because the question isn't offering the map. I'm shaking a little bit because this is so important. I'd be happy to offer a map at another moment. <laughs> but what I'd like to hear right now is from the panelists, my question is, if you could each offer a language that, like a foundational language that feels good, what would it be? Like if, if each one of you is a representative of the movement, like I call it a river of purpose and there's many tributaries, and that's a very fluid way of thinking about it. It works for men and women clients, but like, if you could each offer a language key, what would that be? I, I think I just would love to make a comment on the meta comment that you made, and that's that um, I just have so much respect for the people on the stage, and I hope that it's felt that we've been dancing together and I think if, in fact, we can each find the unique expression, whether it's masculine or feminine or whatever it is, and do that in a way that allows each of us to be penetrated by the other, but also each of us sharing our greatness, that then we're actually moving in an interesting direction. And I've just, I've just felt that with everybody on the stage. I want to honor each of the people. Um, my, I think my word, since you're asking for also a word or, in, or some foundation, I would say that even deeper than purpose is intention, like moving from very conscious intention. And for me, there's something that's, there is a flavor. I feel it in my own body that there's the purpose and then there's something else and does, I do feel the split between the masculine and feminine. The purpose has the certainty quality. This other side has more of like a, an open wondering quality. And I feel like I've learned and need, I'm continuing to learn how to have that balance. But for me, it's about intention. Intention feels like it's even more root. For me, really plainly, I would call it the beauty way. The beauty way, the way of illuminating and bringing forth beauty in the world. As long as that's happening, it's we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> I, I don't really know what to specifically say about what you're saying, but this is what I can offer. What I can offer is what I'm seeing is that the men in our communities are opening their hearts and they're opening their hearts in such a beautiful, genuine way with integrity, and I honor that. 
and they're, and they're inviting us into these conversations where the panels are actually two men and two women. And they're inviting the conversation of what is the masculine view? What is the feminine view? They want to know what we feel. They want to care about what we care about. And so I honor them for asking these questions. I honor for all of us clapping when this conversation comes up. In that way, we're all supporting each other and we're all saying, yes, this is important. The feminine's voice is important. Her care about pain is important. Her care about each of us as a village instead of separated purposes is, is important. So I think we're just, even, we're, we're just beginning. The masculine is just beginning to say, okay, give it to me. I feel it's time to transcend this hypothesis that there's a gender device, racial device. What are we talking about? Just put together in it. I haven't felt that. I don't belong here at all. I come from a village in Egypt. What am I doing here? Should I just say I'm just a minority? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so. Rich topics, huh? Very rich, very rich topics. And I, I, I mean, I personally don't want to, um, I don't want to push to any clarity too, too soon. This is a dialogue that needs to remain open. Um, in the global purpose movement, this is a dialogue that needs to remain open so that it includes all voices. So I really appreciate all the voices that have been uh, part of it here. And I really appreciate all the voices that have been part of it here. Thank you.